how Thucydides' history has uh, been the topic of great attention by people who work on international relations. And a decade ago, uh, a scholar who works in that area, a man called Graham Allison, um, made the news headlines by identifying what he called the Thucydides trap. And the Thucydides trap is thinking about the causes of war in terms of a model in which fear, the fear of the established party of the growth of another party, is what drives war. Um, there's no doubt that Thucydides, as you will see, puts fear onto the agenda of causes of war, uh, and that is part of his contribution to our understanding. What I want to do this afternoon is to talk you through what Thucydides does in his history and to think with you a bit about the implications. You know, why is it that he does it as he does and to what consequence? Okay. So with that uh, preamble, uh, let me uh, share my screen um, and all I'm going to do is to show you uh, a lecture handout so that you can see the text that I'm talking about. Um, those of you who are not uh, ancient historians may be surprised at uh, a historian of the ancient world paying so much attention to source material, but that's part of uh, ancient historians' obsession um, and I won't apologize at all for it in this case since it's how people construct history that I'm uh, specifically interested in. I should also say that if you find me going too fast, you should simply unmute and shout out, slow down. On the whole, I think I probably tend to go too slowly, not too fast, but if I get too fast, I just say so. Good, okay. I want to start not by looking at Thucydides um, but, and, and at the Peloponnesian War, but by looking at what I've called ordinary wars. It isn't as if Greeks had never thought about the causes of war before Thucydides wrote about the causes of the war between the Athenians and their allies and the Peloponnesians, the Spartans and their allies uh, in uh, the last third of the fifth century. There'd been plenty of wars before that and plenty of stories about war. Those stories are often quite happy to think that people go to war simply because it seems like a good idea in the circumstances or because there's an immediate advantage to be got out of it. And very happy to think that those wars are led by individual initiatives, that it depends who the leader is, and the leader, as it were, takes the decision and goes ahead with it and doesn't expect to be asked any questions or tries to avoid those questions. I give you what is perhaps an extreme example. So when the Athenians and the Spartans clashed at the end of the fifth century BC, this wasn't the first time that they had clashed. At the end of the 6th century BC, the Spartans had invaded the territory of Athens in order to remove the established government in Athens, which was at that time uh, a tyranny, so-called, the tyranny of Pisistratus and his sons. Herodotus' account of this in Herodotus' history, Herodotus wrote in the late 5th century, but wrote about the Persian Wars at the beginning of the 5th century and about the antecedents to those wars. So Herodotus, when he writes about this, explains it in the passage that you've got in front of you on the screen um, by saying that um, what happened was that the Athenians, or some Athenians, went to the sanctuary at Delphi where there was a famous oracle and they bribed the Pythian priestess who was in charge of the oracle so that every time any Spartans who should come to inquire 
um, of the priestess on a private or a public account to set Athens free. Right? So every time, whatever the question was, the answer was set Athens free. Um, and having received this oracle, uh, the Spartans simply decide that they ought to act in that way. Then the Lacedaemonians, Spartans, when the same command was ever revealed to them, sent Ancumolius, the son of Aster. So they send an expedition. That um, expedition uh, isn't very successful. So they just, next chapter, after this, the Lacedaemonians sent a greater expedition. So we don't have complicated uh, reasons here. We have very straightforward reasons. Why do the Spartans attack? The Spartans attack because they believe they're being told to do so um, for uh, a cause which, okay, can be represented as morally good, right? They're bringing freedom. But they don't need a great excuse. There doesn't need to be a claim that the Athenians have done something terrible. Uh, they can just move in. Within Thucydides' own history, there are similarly incidents in which um, some of the other states in the Greek world, um, not entirely independently of the Spartans and the Athenians, but essentially independently of the Spartans and the Athenians, um, decide that they're going to go to war. So in book five of his history, Thucydides talks about an occasion when the city of Argos makes war on its neighbor Epidorus. Same summer, war broke out between the Epidorians and the Argives. The pretext was that the Epidorians did not send an offering for their pasture lands to Apollo Pythias, as they were bound to do. The Argives having the chief management of the temple. So one story, okay, there, there's some offense about um, the dues for pasture land, hardly one would think a major cause for conflict. And then we get, ah, but there was another reason, apart from this pretext, Alcibiades, who's an Athenian politician, and the Argives were determined, if possible, to gain possession of Epidorus and thus to ensure the neutrality of Corinth and give the Athenians a shorter passage for their reinforcement from Aegina than if they had to sail around Scylaeum. Okay. So there's strategic advantage to Athens here. So an Athenian politician urges the Argives uh, to uh, take this action. So we have an individual politician who can essentially cook up a reason for war uh, and does so. And um, the Argives uh, prepare to invade Epidorus. Um, that's all they need, right? this uh, slight uh, um, excuse. And Greek historians go on telling stories like that after Thucydides has written up his account of the Peloponnesian War when they are writing about wars in the fourth century BC. Um, I'm going to cut my next example so that I don't spend uh, too long on this point. But uh, in the beginning of the fourth century, in the 390s, uh, there's a another famous incident uh, where uh, essentially some individual politicians who wish to achieve um, a, a, a conflict um, cook up a dispute uh, on a relatively minor matter. Okay. So many wars, um, Greek historians, Greeks in general, when talking about the causes of war, seem very happy to have pointed the fingers at individuals. Um, they don't think you need an elaborate pattern of um, excuse uh, for going to war. There doesn't need to be underlying causes, uh, you can simply see an opportunity and take it. There was, however, also uh, another precedent for how you talk about wars. And this is what I've called extraordinary wars. So the Greek imagination was very much dominated by stories about the Trojan War, the occasion when Greeks um, had got together from many different states and had gone to attack Troy. And they had done so uh, because an individual Trojan prince, Paris, 
had run away with the wife of a Greek um, prince, Menelaus, um, uh, an archaic poet called Semonides at the end of a poem that's all about um, how terrible wives are, um, uh, notes that uh, Zeus um, had put an unbreakable fetter around us ever since death received those that went striving among themselves for the sake of a woman. So here was a different sort of model, a model which put moral offence um, absolutely at the centre, um, and in particular, put moral offence with regard to women. The importance of this motif uh, we can see from the way that Herodotus sets up his history um, of the conflict between uh, the Greeks and the Persians at the beginning of the fifth century. So his preface uh, states that he is particularly interested in what was the cause of the Greeks and the Persians waging war on each other. And he then gets into a sequence of stories told either on the Persian side or on the Greek side about how this started. And they're all stories about one side or the other, snatching a woman um, from uh, the other side. I'm starting by a story uh, about um, uh, um, the snatching of uh, a princess called Io um, by uh, some people who come from uh, and sail back to Egypt. And so the whole series of stories, again, uh, which make um, offences, moral offences with regard to uh, women, um, absolutely central. So that's a rather different model, not a model where people see political opportunities, but a model of offence. So let me turn now uh, to Thucydides against that uh, background. Thucydides' history is rather different from uh, the histories that we generally expect to be written, and indeed to most other histories in antiquity or in modern times, in as far as Thucydides himself says that he wrote the history as the events were happening. So he starts his history, Thucydides an Athenian wrote the history of the war in which the Peloponnesians and the Athenians fought against one another. He began to write when they first took up arms, believing it would be great and memorable above any previous war. For he argued that both states were then at the full height of their military power um, and so on. So he is writing um, from his current perspective, he's able to observe uh, what is going on. He doesn't have to uh, establish what has happened at some past people by inquiring of others. And he goes uh, to explain this war and to write about this war because uh, he finds the war to be so important. And he then spends uh, the first part of his history demonstrating that it was the biggest war that had ever happened. Um, as soon as he's done that, uh, then he turns to saying, well, I'm going to start by talking about the causes, why they broke the treaty, and what were the grounds of the quarrel I will first set forth. Um, I'll come back to exactly what he says there in a moment. And he then um, uh, gives accounts of uh, incidents, diplomatic incidents, we would call them, uh, which uh, led to the war. And there's a whole succession of these incidents, uh, one involving uh, Corsara on Corfu, um, where the people of Corsara uh, want to ally with um, Athens because they are in a dispute with Corinth, but since Corinth uh, is an ally of Sparta, uh, their allying with Athens is seen as a hostile move by um, Corinth. There's a second incident which involves Potidaea, 
a city in the North Aegean, which again has connections with Corinth, and but is an ally of Athens, and where the Athenians want them to sever their links with Corinth. Um, so we're told about both those two uh, instances. Uh, we're then told about the Spartans meeting and discussing uh, whether or not uh, they uh, should go to war and arriving at a decision uh, to go to war. Um, uh, and I, I'll come back uh, to that uh, decision as well. Uh, once they have decided themselves that they will go to war, Thucydides uh, tries to explain how they got into that mindset, not simply on the basis of those diplomatic incidents, but on the basis of what had happened over the previous 50 years. Um, and he has uh, a long account um, of uh, that and um, uh, an account that he's designed to show how Athens has got into a more and more dominant uh, position. Um, that account is then followed by uh, the account of the Spartans consulting their allies. They not only have to decide to go to war themselves, they have to get their allies to support going to war. Um, the allies decide uh, that they too are willing to go to war. Uh, there's then a series of ultimata that go back and forward between the Spartans and the Athenians uh, before the Athenians in the end uh, decide that they are not going to concede uh, to the Spartans and led uh, by uh, um, the man who was the dominant politician at the time, Pericles, uh, they decide they are prepared to face up to war. Um, and on the way in which uh, the books of Thucydides are divided, that takes us to the end of book one and the beginning of book two actually starts the war. So that's the structure of uh, Thucydides' account. Let me now look at it in a bit more detail. So after he has explained uh, how um, the war that he is going to write about was more important, was more major than any previous war, uh, Thucydides um, uh, turns to the question of cause. Um, and he says that um, why uh, the peace that had prevailed in um, uh, the previous decade, why that was broken, and what the grounds of the quarrel were, I will first set forth that in time to come, no man may be at a loss to know what was the origin of this great war. And then he says, the real, though unavowed cause, or sometimes uh, translated as the truest cause, I believe to have been the growth of Athenian power, which terrified the Spartans and forced them into war. But the reasons publicly alleged on either side were as follows. Thucydides uses two different Greek terms here in Joet's translation, um, which is the one that you've got on the screen. Joet, great 19th century uh, English classicist. Uh, he uh, talks of cause, unavowed cause for the first word and talks um, about reasons for the second. Um, the uh, word he translates as cause uh, actually is sometimes used as pretext or excuse. It's what he's said. Um, and it's one of the peculiarities of the way in which Thucydides sets this explanation up, that he says that the truest um, reason that was spoken, the truest cause that was said, was least spoken about, <laughs> um, which would seem to be a contradiction in terms. Um, and uh, the other uh, word that is translated by Joad as reason here uh, is a word which um, also sometimes can imply blame. So it's, it's a much more normal cause word 
doesn't concentrate on what he said. Uh, it concentrates on, as it were, responsibility. This division between the truest cause, the growth of Athenian power, terrifying the Spartans and forcing them into war, um, on the one hand, and the reasons publicly alleged, these various diplomatic offenses on the other, um, that division uh, has been um, fundamental to how historians have since thought about uh, causes of war. Um, one of the ways in which uh, that is uh, sometimes expressed is that uh, on the one hand, you have the short term causes or the immediate causes, or the occasions for going to war. And on the other, you have the long term causes or the underlying causes. Um, uh, on the screen, you can see I've, I've quoted a couple of, of modern scholars writing about this. Uh, Simon Hornblower and his commentary on Thucydides uh, uh, reckons that the explicit formulation of a distinction between profound and superficial cause is arguably Thucydides' greatest contribution to later history writing. And Christopher Pelling um, writes that the truest explanation makes it clear why there was a war waiting to happen and the grounds and elements of rift uh, explain why it happened in 431 rather than 435 or 427. And Pelling then goes on to point out that these two things are different um, and the first is truest in the sense that uh, there was going to be a war at some point or another given the fear that the Spartans had of Athenian growing power, whereas the um, reasons publicly alleged are simply an explanation as to why it happened exactly then. If it hadn't been going to happen exactly then, if, if those incidents hadn't come about, there would still have been war, uh, but there would have been some different occasion for it. Whereas uh, on the other side, if those incidents had happened, but there had been no fear, then there would have been no war. So this division between the sort of underlying um, uh, cause and the immediate uh, um, sparks that uh, set the war uh, alight, as it were, um, this is a fundamental way of thinking about um, how you account for wars. When we look, in fact, at what Thucydides goes on to do, uh, there's something of a collapse uh, of those two reasons. It isn't as if the two incidents that happen, the dispute uh, over whether Corsaira uh, might or might not ally with Athens, despite being uh, closely linked to Corinth, um, and the incident over Potidaea, in both those cases, the growth of Athenian power and the fear that the Spartans have are directly relevant to the decisions that are taken. So they're not independent. So if you look at the passage on the handout, when the people of Corsaira come and ask the Athenians for help, um, what the Athenians, uh, what, what they say to the Athenians uh, is that uh, if anyone thinks that the war in which our services uh, may be needed will never arrive, he is mistaken. He doesn't see that the Spartans, fearing the growth of your empire, are keen to take up arms. That is, given that there's this underlying cause, you should strike first, make the preemptive strike. So the incident itself is uh, influenced by this underlying fear. That's a, um, repeatedly stressed. Um, the same applies within the incident at, at Potidaea, where again, uh, it's a suspicion and fear uh, that underlie it. Um, this time, actually, what we see is it's the Athenians who uh, are as much uh, fearing what others will do as the Spartans are. 
we've got a general climate of suspicion uh, that is the consequence of uh, what is happening. In the course of uh, book one, as well as these two major diplomatic incidents, uh, Thucydides alludes to the fact that there were various other allegations that were made. Um, and uh, uh, when the Spartans are thinking about what to do and they get their allies to come and talk to them, their allies make various claims, and this includes um, a claim made by the Megarians. Now, the Megarians are the neighbors of the Athenians, um, uh, and uh, they uh, came and complained that they had been excluded from all the harbors within the Athenian domin dominion and from the Athenian market. Now, this is going to be important because within Thucydides' account, although it's mentioned a couple of times, uh, this is not presented as at all um, of interest uh, over the nature of the decision. Um, but others who uh, write about that war uh, make much more of that, and I'll come to that uh, in a moment. So, uh, where are we in, in um, Thucydides' account of the war? What we have is him having set up uh, this framework within which there are incidents which we're predisposed to think actually create a lot of sort of noise and fuss at the time, but they're not really important because the really important thing uh, is the increase in Athenian power. He emphasizes this by uh, what he has happen at Sparta when they vote for war. The Spartans are persuaded to vote for war and Thucydides writes, in arriving at this decision and resolving to go to war, the Spartans were influenced not so much by the speeches of their allies, which tell about all these particular incidents, as by the fear of the Athenians and their increasing power. And he actually makes this the excuse for then spending several chapters describing that uh, increase in power um, uh, in various sorts of ways. I'm not going to go into at the moment in detail, but when he concludes that account of how over the 50 years before the beginning of the war, their power had increased, he again states, um, uh, that uh, the um, Spartans, um, uh, because of the 50 years developments, um, where the Athenians had acquired, as he writes, a firmer hold over their empire, and the city itself became a great power, the Spartans, seeing what was going on, um, they'd remained inactive, um, but the Athenians were now growing too great to be ignored and were laying hands on their allies. But it's not the particular instance of laying hands, it's the growing too great to be ignored uh, that he's stressed here. Now, um, in order to put what Thucydides does into perspective, it's important to know what other people were saying at the time. Uh, and we have some quite good evidence for this, if albeit from a peculiar source. So from the last 30 years of the fifth century, from the period of the Peloponnesian War, we have an extraordinary amount of Athenian literature, including a large number of comedies uh, by a playwright called Aristophanes. His earliest surviving work, uh, The Acarnians, is a play that argues for peace, argues for ending this war. Um, but in arguing for that, it gives its own account um, of the origins. And it's an account which very explicitly says the Spartans are not to blame. And yet I ask for only friends are present for this speech. Why do we blame the Spartans for, for this? For it was men of ours. I do not say the city. Remember this, I do not say the city. But some troublemaking excuses for men 
misminted, worse, worthless, etc., and began denouncing the Megarians. So he puts the dispute with Megara at the center, and he claims that at the dispute with Megara arose because of some Megarians um, who um, uh, had responded to Athenians who had um, stolen a prostitute from Megara by stole, stealing prostitutes run by Pericles, the great Athenian statesman's wife, Aspasia. In other words, we have a tit for tat um, stealing of women, just like the cause that Herodotus had claimed for the Persian Wars. Now, there are two uh, interesting points here. One is that the focus is on Megara, and the second is that this puts the um, attention on an individual statesman's decision. It's because of an offence to his wife that Pericles is made to uh, decide that the Athenians should go to war. Now, we might think this is just a silly joke. Um, but uh, one of the great historians of the fourth century BC, a man called Ephorus, whose work doesn't survive intact, but whose work survives in as far as it's quoted by other historians, decided when he wrote about the origins of the Peloponnesian War in his history, that he would take most seriously the account which Aristophanes had given, both in that uh, uh, play called Acanians, and then there's a parallel account in a play called Peace, which uh, is actually quoted uh, by Ephorus as um, evidence. And we know this because Ephorus uh, was quoted, explicitly quoted uh, by uh, Diodorus, a historian who writes much, much later in the first century BC. So Ephorus somehow had found Thucydides' account of the origins of war unsatisfactory and preferred to concentrate on an account which came essentially out of a comic playwright. And we might think this is a very odd thing to do. But if we think back to where I started and the sorts of accounts of ordinary wars, as I've called them, that were given uh, by Greek historians, we can see that it wasn't perhaps so strange a thing to do. At the center of Ephorus' explanation, taken over um, uh, from uh, Aristophanes in part, is a little story about uh, Pericles getting into trouble because he has surreptitiously used some money and he doesn't want to admit to the Athenians why he's used it. It's not a suggestion here that, that as it were, Pericles is corrupt, uh, just that he needs to be secretive about what he's done uh, because of the possible political implications of revealing it. Um, and he is advised uh, by uh, Alcibiades, his, his um, uh, young relative, um, that he should simply avoid giving ex any explanation by stirring up trouble so that nobody should think about uh, the other incident. Um, and we've then got uh, uh, quotations about how exactly uh, Pericles goes about doing that, uh, which are based on Aristophanes' play the piece. So this puts not only a personal explanation, but also a financial, if not economic, um, explanation at the center. Ephorus has made the war look very much like the accounts of ordinary wars. And that leads us to ask why it is that Thucydides didn't write an account uh, like that. <clears throat> 
Why is it that Thucydides uh, writes an account which focuses uh, much more on this um, a suggestion that there is underlying fear? Okay. Now, um, I want to, I'm not going to go uh, into great detail, um, given how long I've talked already, uh, uh, about um, how Thucydides himself develops uh, the narrative. I want instead um, just to turn your attention to this motive of fear. And to the whole way in which uh, the discussion that Thucydides gives um, encourages us to think that there's something really terrible about being responsible for this war in a way that, uh, again, uh, those ordinary wars we've seen uh, explanations for uh, simply take war to be doing politics by other means, uh, to, to borrow a phrase. By focusing on the one hand on the diplomatic stories and on the other hand, uh, the question of fear, Thucydides implies that there's a sort of blame. Right? There's, a, there's a blame in a technical sense as to who was at fault in these diplomatic incidents. And that's something where the argument goes backwards and forwards. Um, and both uh, in, in the course of the uh, of book one, uh, where you know, the Corsarians, not surprisingly, uh, claim that the Athenians won't breach the treaty if it assists them. The Corinthians uh, oppose this and say, no, yeah, that's um, quite wrong. Um, uh, the Athenians, uh, when they decide, try and have it both ways by, by uh, making a slightly peculiar form of treaty with Corsaira so that they wouldn't be obliged to attack. Um, Corinth. So all of this is suggesting that, that they desperately want to avoid blame. Um, and later on, Thucydides will uh, return and note that the Spartans come to think that uh, they were to blame for the war. And um, that it had been their offence uh, when he, he comments uh, in a much later book uh, about uh, why the, the Spartans um, were prepared to take actions that they did later. Um, uh, they thought they were in a different position from the position they'd been at the beginning. I want to bring this uh, together, however, uh, to note how peculiar that is. Now, partly, we might now be able to see that Thucydides too wants to make his war a grand war. We've seen that the Trojan War, as set up uh, by um, Homer, um, the Trojan War has, as it were, a moral offence, the stealing of Helen um, at its centre. And we've seen that uh, when Herodotus sets up the Persian Wars, he starts off with a whole series of allegations that, again, put a moral offence at the centre. If this is a great war, then there better be a moral offence. But he's doing something beyond that. Whereas these other accounts point the finger very much at individuals or groups and particular incidents, Thucydides is wanting to say, no, there's something much more structural going on. There is this underlying cause, which is fear. That's a narrative that's very difficult to argue with. Whenever you get a particular incident and there's a moral question as to who was right and who was wrong, um, uh, there is at least some forms of argument you can have on either side. But when you point the finger at fear, then who is to deny fear and who is going to be prepared to say actually fear is a moral failing that's a much more difficult thing to do 
fear becomes almost this ideal excuse for going to war, an excuse even for taking the preemptive strike, as we have seen. The Corsairians arguing at Athens argue that the Athenians ought, ought to make this alliance because if not, they will be put into a position of danger themselves. So fear is a very different underlying cause. I go back to the Thucydides trap. Graham Allison uh, used Thucydides and the idea of fear of a growing power um, uh, as an explanation for war globally within the modern world. And he looked at a whole number of modern conflicts um, and claimed to identify uh, this pattern in them. There's been lots of disputes since as to whether he was correct in identifying that pattern or not. Um, but I'm not interested in that question. What I'm interested in is the role that this sort of explanation gives. Thucydides writes about the Peloponnesian War from one side of the conflict. He is an Athenian. He lived through the war. He was a general on, for the Athenians for part of the war until he failed to uh, get on time to save a city from Spartan attack and was then himself exiled from Athens. But he starts writing this account very much as an Athenian. He identifies himself as such. He's undoubtedly an interested party he has his own political interests at stake here. And it's difficult to think that his account is not influenced by that. He has found within this structure of explanation, he has found a way um, of avoiding uh, the finger of blame pointing to the Athenians. He's found a sort of explanation which turns war into a sort of natural event. It's bound to be the case that some cities get stronger and some cities get weaker. And if fear of growing power is going to bring about war, their war is simply going to be the product of those inevitable changes as uh, cities, as it were, grow and diminish in, in their influence. We can't ignore the politics of the way in which you structure your accounts of causes. It's never going to be possible to find a way of accounting for war that is not political. And part of the value of looking at Thucydides' history is we can examine with regard to events which we don't have a stake in the ways in which legal blame on the one hand, psychological causes like fear on the other, play into an overall politics of how you see the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>